Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, which is available as a paperback and audiobook, and the ebook is free. Free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. Uh, for more information about my other books, more information to, uh, about uh, authors, uh, publishing professionals, editors, literary agents, interviews with all the best people, plus the back catalog of the show, head to middlegradeninja.com. And that's all the intro we have time for. Uh, my God, Aaron uh, and Trada Kelly is here this evening. I couldn't be more thrilled to talk with you. Um, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks so much for, for carving out time for us. Um, esteemed audience knows that I never summarize other people's books or other people's biographies. Uh, and that's how I, I make sure that I make friends in the industry. Um, so my first question is always, would you give uh, esteemed audience kind of an overview of your background? Sure. So my name is Erin Entrada Kelly, of course, and I'm best known for writing uh, contemporary realistic fiction for the middle grade audience. Um, uh, my best work, my best known work is the 2018 Newbery Medal winner, Hello Universe. I also received the 2021 Newbery Honor for We Dream of Space. Can't never remember what, what year we're in anymore. Um, and my most recent book is Maybe, Maybe Marisol Rainey, which is my first, um, work for early elementary readers and it's also the first book that i've illustrated but i'm hoping we're going to be getting uh if not direct sequels uh similar similar works in the near future it's it's planned as a series yes yes <laughs> this is excellent news uh, and i was uh checking my notes we were originally uh going to have a podcast discussion uh march of 2020 and then something came up i, I can't imagine what <laughs> yeah who, yeah who what was that i don't know but here we are i'm, I'm so thrilled that we we've got this opportunity to chat uh, i've got uh, all kinds of questions about the book all kinds of questions uh, about you uh, in fact i'm i'm uh, almost uh uh, uncertain as to where to begin. So maybe the best place to start is, is at the beginning. What is your first memory of wanting to be an author? My first memory of wanting to be an author was as early as eight years old. I read a lot. I was a little bookworm. I read a lot of Judy Bloom, And, you know, at some point I realized that Judy Bloom was writing words on paper and I had words and I had paper and I had a pencil and, you know, I just picked up a pencil and started writing my own stories and I've been writing ever since. So it's pretty much been a lifelong ambition, a lifelong dream. And did you know from those early days that you wanted specifically you wanted to write fiction and you wanted to write children's books similar to Judy Bloom or was there a. I think at the time, you know, I think a lot of writers, especially young writers, kind of emulate the, the, the writers that they're reading. So when I was young, I wanted to write books like Judy Bloom, but I didn't necessarily recognize them as children's books because I was a child, you know. Uh, but as I got older, you know, and I started reading things like Stephen King, then I wanted to write books like Stephen King and V.C. Andrews, and then I wanted to write V.C. Andrews books. So um, it wasn't until adulthood in my 20s when I realized that I wanted to write specifically for children. So it was kind of a an evolutionary process as I figured out what my voice was and what audience I, my voice was best suited for that I came to realize that's the audience that I needed to be writing for. And is there a possibility we might yet see your version of a Stephen King or a V.C. Andrews novel or are we holding steady? I mean, children's books are, are working out for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's working well. Um, no, at this point, I have zero interest in writing for adults. I did start, actually start, uh, kind of how I came to the realization that I wanted to write for kids is that I started with publishing short stories for adults. And, you know, at some point, you know, after I'd published like 20 or so short stories, I realized that most of them were uh, featured characters who are between the ages of 8 and 12 and most of them were coming of age stories um, and it just kind of clicked in my brain I was thinking there's something about that age that really that I'm really connecting with 
And that's when I realized I needed to be writing for and about uh, that age group. So at this point, um, not only is it working out very well, obviously, but the audience, uh, you really can't beat a children's audience. And not just the kids themselves, but teachers and librarians. Who, it's just an incredible community, and I really don't have an interest in in breaking out of that community and writing for grown-ups. Although I love to read adult fiction. You know, I read kind of everything from picture books all the way through adult. But So I'll just remain a reader in those in those areas and stick to writing children's books. How, uh, how much time do you spend reading every week as opposed to writing? Oh boy, what a great question. Um, I consider myself a reader first and I read about two books a week on average. It depends, of course, on, on what book it is. Um, so I would say I read two to three books a week and writing, it really depends. If, if I'm really in, in the middle of a project, um, I can spend a few hours a day writing, but I don't really keep a set schedule. I just kind of like go when the spirit moves me. Um, so I can either sit and write for hours or I could sit and write for 20 minutes. Um, it just really depends. But but I would say on an average week, I probably read more than I write. So on those 20 minute days, how do you quiet down that voice in the back of your head that says 20 minutes? That's that's not nearly enough. Do you just glance over at your Newberry and say, no, it's fine. <laughs> I just keep the Newberry close to my heart. No, um, you know what? Honestly, I've learned to um, for a long time, I really struggled with process and trying to figure out what the right way to do it is. And I don't focus on quantity anymore. I focus on quality. Um, now, that doesn't mean that in 20 minutes I, I write the most beautiful words ever written and then I get up and, and leave feeling great about myself. But um, I really focus on what my creative spirit is telling me to do, which sounds kind of, you know, maybe that sounds a little new agey. But if after 20 minutes I don't feel like writing anymore, in my view, there's no point in continuing because it's just going to feel very forced and cerebral and I don't want that to happen. So that's when I get up and do something else. So I try not to focus so much on, on you know, these, these qualitative things, if that makes sense. That does a little, I imagine I'm talking to you after a great deal of trial and error to figure out what is the best process to, to produce your books. I know you had started off at some point as you were an editor for Thrive Magazine. Is that where you started? Was in was in magazines and short fiction? Or how did you get you started into publishing? So I started my my professional career as a journalist. And, and then I moved on to, uh, as a newspaper reporter, and then I moved on to uh, Thrive Magazine. And then I was a, a corporate copy editor um, before becoming a full-time writer and teacher. And during that time, I was writing fiction, you know, all throughout that time. Um, and I think that I tried so many different things, you know, like you hear these, these words of wisdoms, like you must write every day or you must sit down from 8 a.m. to noon and only write, or you must set aside this block of time. And I would try to do those things, um, but it I've learned that it really, really depends on the individual because everyone is so different in the way that they create. So I would try to do these these methods that, that I thought were the quote unquote right way to do them. And it would just feel like forced. It would feel like homework. It would feel like I was doing an assignment if I forced myself to sit at the same time every day. So you're right. It absolutely took a lot of trial and error to figure out exactly what kind of writer I am. And the kind of writer I am is that um, I write when I feel compelled to. The good news is that I feel compelled to often. <laughs> so I guess the day when I don't feel compelled to anymore is the day I'll, I'll start to worry. But um, so if I feel compelled for 20 minutes and I write 100 words, that's great. If I feel compelled for 10 hours and I write 14,000 words, that's great too. 
And of course, that uh, brings its own problems because at the end of 10 hours, do you find that you've got maybe an hour's worth of writing that is just nonsense after nine hours? Of, Let me just chuck this in the morning. I, I, I could have spent that time watching television. Or <laughs> well, you know, because I have this mindset, right, that there's never wasted time writing. So even if it's all nonsense and I wind up cutting 12,000 of that 14,000 words, that is not 12,000 words that I wasted. And I, and I believe that to my core. So I think that helps me mentally, you know, and emotionally probably because um, I believe that all the writing we do um, only makes us better. So those 12,000 words that I would have cut um, led me to the better 12,000 words that I'm going to write in its place. So that's how I reconcile that. That is extremely inspirational. I'm stealing that from my next workshop. I'm going to oh, pass good. it off as an original thought. <laughs> <laughs> please do. Please do. <laughs> you have my permission. No, my students listen to the show. They know they know where I get my stuff from. <laughs> um, so, okay. So um, you're working as an editor. You work your way up. And you're doing all kinds of stuff. At what point do you reach out to uh, Sarah Crow at Pippin Properties? So I, so I was publishing sh short stories. And at the time, I was having trouble finishing a novel because I was writing a novel for adults. And then when I realized I want to write for young people, um, I started doing that. So I finished a couple of manuscripts. And then I went out and, and queried them. Very traditional querying process. Sarah's actually my third agent, so she she was always my number one choice, but she rejected me twice. Um, and finally, on the third try, um, after Blackbird Fly, my first book came out, um, and I think my second book was just about to come out, um, I had a brand new manuscript, and I queried her a third time. I parted ways with my second agent and I queried Sarah a third time. And this time she said yes. So that's kind of how I found my way to Sarah. A very traditional process of querying. Um, you know, I didn't have at the time, you know, necessarily the means or the time or the resources to go to a lot of writers conferences to meet agents and editors, which is something that a lot of people do, which is a great thing to do, but not everyone can do it. So my process was very traditional in that sense. Just reading online and finding them the best people from what you were able to gather there? Yes, exactly. A lot of uh, Publishers Marketplace, a lot of Query Tracker, a lot of uh, Writers um, Market, you know, a lot of research. I did a ton of research, but it was all online. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, and then, um, what's the process for getting Blackbird published? Uh, how, and then what, how many books had you written? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that was the very first book you, you wrote, but I could be incorrect in that. It was the, it was the second full manuscript. I think it was the second full manuscript I had written. And, you know, after countless unfinished uh, started and abandoned manuscripts. So it was the second full manuscript that I finished. The first manuscript did get picked up and I eventually kind of used that as the seed for um, my fantasy, uh, Lani of the Distant Sea, which was which wound up being my fifth book or sixth book. I can't remember at this point, but um, so I did repurpose that first manuscript. Um, but Blackbird Fly was the, the the first one to get picked up by an agent, and it ultimately went to Harper Collins. And I've been with the same publisher and the imprint there ever since for every book. Gotcha. Uh, and that uh, phase of, of starting things and then abandoning them, does that still happen, or has that sorted itself out as you've had some writing success? That's a great question. It, it's it's for the most part sorted itself out. I still start some things and, and abandon them. Um, I've become a bit more disciplined because contracts and deadlines, you know, kind of force you to be more disciplined. Um, but also I've, I've kind of, I feel like I've found my um, path, so to speak, that I want to walk and I've tried I still want to try other things. Like I love reading horror. You know, like I said, I was a huge Stephen King fan. I like reading um, kind of dark fiction, scary fiction. Um, and I've tried to write 
manuscripts in that vein before for children. Um, but I think that at least at this point, my voice is not well suited yet for that. And maybe it will be one day, who knows? I love science fiction. So one day maybe I'll try that and see what happens. But um, so for now, I still start things and abandon them. I still jot down ideas and abandon them, but I'm much more disciplined in in finishing the things that I need to finish. Do you have like kind of a, a grand scheme of here is how I see my career? Uh, you know, like a big blueprint that you check every day. And like, I oh, got my oh, Newbery honor after my Newbery award plan is proceeding nicely. <laughs> or... <laughs> um, that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to say yes and no, because obviously we can't control uh, whether we win awards or what, you know, what reviews we get. So in that sense, of course, nobody can plan that. But you know, one thing that I always wanted for myself and my dream when I started out was that I wanted to be like Judy Bloom in the sense that Judy Bloom has a large catalog of works and you could get 10 people together who love Judy Bloom and you could ask them what their favorite Judy Bloom book is and you may get five, seven, 10 different answers because even though she has this body of work that that is similar thematically and has a lot of, of things that make you know that it's a Judy Bloom book, they're also very different in individual works. And that's the kind of writer that I wanted to be. I wanted to be someone who had a book that spoke to readers for different reasons. And in that sense, I feel like um, I feel like I'm, I'm not going to say I've done that because that sounds like, oh, I've done that. You know? <laughs> but I feel like that's, I feel like my trajectory has followed that well because I feel like uh, my books are very different from one another, but also very similar to one another. Um, and, and that's kind of what I, what I wanted for myself and my readers. Well, I mean, even at this point, I know that you're going to continue to write and, and, and evolve and do all sorts of um, interesting things. Uh, but but already, I mean, readers who discover Marisol um, are going to uh, maybe age up and then find We Dream of Space the next year. Uh, and they can continue to follow. And if you write some horrific uh, young adult novels, uh, they can they can keep going all the way to graduation. <laughs> yeah, that hey, that would be amazing. Um, and then uh, you uh, have got, uh, what, an MFA uh, as well, and just, you become a professor of children's literature. Is that right? Yes. Is that a full-time arrangement, or how does that work at this point? No, it's um, part-time. So right now, it's usually a class. So I teach at Hamlin, uh, low residency MFA program, um, which is part-time. And I teach at Rosemont MFA and that's usually a class a semester and it's mostly for several reasons number one i love teaching and i love talking about writing and i love talking about books um and also though from from a kind of a selfish standpoint as you know writing can be very solitary it can be very um isolating and being able to teach um in these great mfa programs is a way to build community for the students, but also for the faculty. And so it kind of helps get us out of our writer bubbles, you know, which is important because if, if you write um, and that's what you do full time, it can get, you know, you, you kind of get in this writer bubble. And I like to break out of that bubble and, and talk writing with other writers, with students. Um, so that's the arrangement I have right now, teaching. Outside of the uh, students, do you have critique partners, writing friends that you call up and say, hey, publishing is not for you today and I need to cry on your shoulder? Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's never happened to you. Maybe they're calling to cry on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I have, um, I have one specific, I mean, I have more than one writer friend, but I have one writing partner and every week we do check-ins to see what we're working on and swap pages if we're working on something. Um, and that's been an incredible uh, gift because, it, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how the arrangement would work out because, like I said, I don't write every day and sometimes I, I can go a week or two without writing anything. So um, when we decided to pair up and keep each other accountable, I wasn't sure how it was going to work, but it turned out to be you know one of the 
the best things. And it actually started right before COVID hit. We decided we were going to meet every week at the coffee shop. And then, of course, we met once and then, you know, we couldn't meet anymore. So then we FaceTime every week. And it really has um, kept me motivated. You know, I said I write when I feel compelled to. And one reason I feel compelled to or have felt compelled to this past year is because I had this writing partner who I would swap pages with. And it was so great to, to sit there and talk things out with her about her pages and about my pages. So, yes, I do have that community as well. I am curious, as you get closer to contract deadline, do you find yourself more compelled? <laughs> a little bit longer each day. Yes, that's yes, exactly. And, and I think that that, you know, it's very different writing to a contract, writing to a deadline is very different than than not, you know, so definitely um you know having that contract and that looming deadline certainly does help me feel compelled <laughs> cuz i know it's coming right someone's asking for it on the other end which is another good reason to have a critique group and a and a writing partner right because someone's asking for it um you're accountable to someone else i mean at this point if you've got uh, an idea um how does it work do you sit down and like, i'll write a few pages of this or is it uh, if I've got a strong enough idea, well, at what point do you want to get um, your your agent, your editor involved? Because um, you don't want to spend a lot of time on something that, well, could you write something that no one would be interested in? No, at this point, probably not. <laughs> so maybe that's not a concern. Let's not figure that out. Let's, <laughs> let's test that theory. Uh, <laughs> um, at this point, I, I, I involve my agent as soon as I have an idea and I'll usually send her, I'll write up a query letter, which is strange because she's already my agent, but it just helps me think. So I'll write up like a query letter and a synopsis and I'll share it with my agent and my editor. And, um, you know, and if it's a go, then I start working on that project. But because I've been so fortunate that I've been with the same imprint for all of my books, my editor and I and the team at Harper, we have a a great relationship. So I kind of, I kind of um, anticipate their questions, um, concerns if they have any, and um, it, it's a really great relationship. So, you know, it, it's, I can get them involved early in the process and feel confident going forward as I, you know, set forth to write something. Now, that being said that I haven't what, well, whenever I wrote Lilani of the Distant Sea, which was my first and only to date fantasy, um, I was, I was, I don't know if concerned is the right word, but I was curious what the reaction would be because I had written realistic fiction and here I was going to write this fantasy and they were incredibly supportive. I mean, it was not, it, there was no discouragement on their part. So if I said, I want to write a space opera next, um, you know, I don't know what they would say. <laughs> but maybe they, maybe it'd be the same thing where they're like, okay, we can try that, you know, with like caution. But um, I don't know. At this point, you know, I'm I'm in a good spot at this point because I do involve them early on, early in the process, and have confidence going forward as I write the first draft. Are you a type plotter? I am, yes, I write an outline, I write a chapter outline, but I do uh, change the outline as I go, as it as it needs to be changed, you know, because sometimes characters take us on directions we don't plan, and I never want to be shackled to an outline. So even though I do outline and I do know where the story is going and where I want it to end, I will tweak the outline as I'm writing um, to fit where the characters take me. Does that create um, any any additional complications now that you are involving uh, other folks that are that are eager, that are excited, that okay, we're definitely going to have uh, one of Aaron's newest, uh, so we got to we got to make sure we got a, a spot in the market. And like bad news, I just had an idea that's going to take an extra year to finish this. Uh, does that complicate things that way? It hasn't yet, and I think because whenever I involve my agent and editor, I'm giving them kind of like a, a sweeping synopsis you know what I mean I don't share the outlines with them um, so after I share the synopsis and the summaries and then I move forward with my drafts they don't see 
anything about the work again until I finish a draft and then I share the draft with them. Um, and usually the, the heart of the story hasn't changed that much. You know, if I'm writing a coming of age story, it's still going to be that. Um, so I haven't run into that trouble just yet, but I, I, I try not to involve them in the actual drafting of the book process because I think that that would um, throw me off a little bit. You know, it would, you know, if you, I feel like if you share, if you share work too early, it can, um, depending on what kind of writer you are, it can muddle things sometimes, depending on what kind of feedback you get. So I keep it close. I share it with my, my writing partner, Sharon, that I just mentioned, but I don't share it with my agent and editor until the draft is done. Yeah, so, so Sharon's the first person to read everything? Yes, and my partner, Dan. Gotcha. Uh, and then, so they read it, then they say, Aaron, this is your best yet, or oh my God, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and then uh, based on their feedback, do you make tweaks and then send it off? Yes. So there's, there's, um, you know, with, with the fantasy, because it was my first for, foray into fantasy, um, my editor sent back, I, I mean, pages and pages of questions and concerns. And um, that book had to be almost revised from beginning to end several times. Um, so that process, I would say on average, each of my books have been revised probably, I would say four to six times you know, pretty heavily from, from start to finish before it goes into copy edits, you know, before it reaches those last stages of grammatical errors and, and punctuation and all that good stuff. So, yeah, it's a process. I mean, at this point, knowing that you're going to have copy editors and everybody else pour through it, do you, um, you wouldn't want to turn in a sloppy manuscript. I'd never suggest such a thing. But do you sweat the commas and the periods and that stuff as much? Oh, no, no, not at all. I mean, honestly, I mean, people may think that this is a wild thing to say, but they do send me the, the manuscript so that I can approve or review every change, uh, no matter how small. But there's times when I just almost want to say, you know what, just make the changes. <laughs> I don't mean like, I don't mean like structural changes. I mean, like, you know, they're they're very meticulous, right? And copy editors, I don't know how they do it. But um, you know, do you mind if we replace the M dash here with a comma? Do you mind if we use this word instead of that word for like grammatical, you know, consistency? And I have to go through and sign off on all of them. And part of me just wants to say, just do all of them um, because it's so tedious. And, and half the time, I mean, like 99.5% of the time, the copy editor is correct anyway. So, um, cause they're not changing the, the cadence of the sentence or anything. It's usually something, something small and grammatical, which is definitely not, you know, my number one forte, but I'll tell you what though, going through all those little comments and, and notes has made me a better writer because then I think about them the next time I'm drafting, right? Because I remember, oh yeah, that this is, you know, it's not supposed to be lay, it's supposed to be lie or whatever it is. Good for you. I get notes from my editor. Like, still haven't uh, caught this yet, huh? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> well, forget it. I mean, I'll never know the difference between lie, lay, and, and lies or whatever. So now I just don't have anyone laying, you know. That's how I fix that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a long list of just known brain farts where I'm not going to catch this stuff. It's always going to slip through. So let's just do a search and replace for all these things. Protect me from me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I think the, the thing that I get uh, dinged on the most is word echoes. You know, when you kind of use the same words um, a lot of times on the same page or in the same paragraph. But you know what? I mean, that's what the copy editors are for to help you figure that stuff. So uh, going back to the, the debut, I want to I I talk about uh, some of these awards and then I want to talk about uh, Marisol uh, as well uh, and, and everything else that we have time for. Uh, but your debut novel, Blackbird Fly, comes out. Obviously, it's your debut novel. I'm assuming you're a fan, but it's still got to be tremendous. It comes out. It's the Kirkus best book. It's the School Library Journal best book. It's an ALSC notable book, uh, Asian Pacific American Literature Honor book. 
this, it, 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 that's a nice launch, right? How gratifying is that? How are you feeling that whole year? Can anybody talk to you or tell you anything? Or, oh. <laughs> it was, it was, it was over. We'll say it was overwhelming. And I think that it was surreal because, you know, I had carried this lifelong dream of being a published author. And then I was a published author and it, you know, it was a whirlwind of emotions associated with it. So, um, yeah, it was an incredible, it was an incredible launch. It was just, it was very, very surreal. I can't think of another word to, ex to explain it. So after that, you've got to come back and you've got to, you've got to write more books. Um, do you have a, do you have a period of paralyzing fear where you look at the page and like, well, obviously I've written the best thing I'm ever going to write. What could I ever, I ever write now? Uh, first of all, I'm, t I'm much too full of self-loathing to ever think I've written the best thing I'm ever going to write. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so no, you know what, honestly, I think the best way to survive in this business is what, what I tell people is to always be working on the next thing. So by the time Blackbird Fly came out, I had already finished, um, Land of Forgotten Girls, which was my second book. Um, so I've always been working a book ahead. Um, and, you know, I, I always feel like, um, I think with every book that I write, I feel like I could have done better. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, hopefully I never get to that apex where I'm like, well, that's it. I wrote the best book I'm ever going to write. And now I can't write anything. I don't ever want to get to that point because that, that would be a paralyzing fear. But luckily, um, you know, I never think that. I always think, you know what, Aaron, that, that could have been better. You could have. You could have done a better job on that book. I've heard you uh, publicly say that Land of Forgotten Girls is your favorite, uh, the favorite of your books, or at least it was at the time of the, the, the video I watched. I don't know if that's, uh, if that's changed since. Um, even with that one, you don't feel like really nailed that one. Uh, good yeah, job, me. Now, well, I mean, you know, I do, <laughs> I do give myself a pat and say, good job, you wrote a book. That's a huge deal, obviously. But... Um, I never, I, I can say with 100% honesty, I've never finished a book and been like, boy, you really nailed that one, you know? Um, the reason that's my favorite, I think, is because um, it's there's something very special to me about it because it's a story about sisters. It's a story about the power of imagination to overcome dire circumstances. Um, there's a lot of themes in it that are important to me. And the, the main character, Soledad, is, is kind of, I, I consider her an aspirational character, meaning she she's very flawed, but she's also the kid, the kind of kid that I wish I had been, um, which makes her very special to me in a way that Apple, who is the main character of my debut novel, was very much me um, at that age. And Sol is more like, you know, kind of the character I wish I was. Um, so it, it has a special place in my heart for those reasons, but not necessarily for craft reasons. You know, it's just a special book and each book is special for different reasons. I love Lalani because it was my first fantasy. I love You Go First, which is my fourth book because it has one of my favorite characters in it. So each one is special for different reasons, but, but usually my affinity for the books that I've written have nothing to do with the craft of writing them, if that makes sense. It has more to do with the experience of writing them. So is it not so much the book itself, but your memories of who you were, where you were when you were writing them? That's part of it. And and part of it, like with Marisol, for example, Marisol's a very, very special book to me because I illustrated it. Um, and I think about how hard it was to, to do the illustrations and how much self-doubt I had. And how, how much Marisol is like me, you know, when I was eight years old. And it's more of a connection to the story than, than the craft. You know, I, I'm never, you know, I think like a lot of writers, it's, I'm never, you know, completely satisfied with, with the craft. You know, when I read other authors and I think, oh, I wish I could write like them. You know, I, I think a lot of writers feel that way, right? Where you have this um, imposter syndrome and... Um, you play the comparison game and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, my affinity for my books has, has less to do with the craft of them and more to do with the story and the experience of them. Well, I've got uh, lots of other questions, but 
but maybe the best way to, to do this is to dig into maybe maybe Marisol Rainey for a moment. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll we'll talk newberries and maybe Netflix and who knows what else. Sure. Uh, but uh, tell us, uh, I promise never to summarize your biography or your book. Please tell us about uh, Marisol Rainey. So maybe, maybe Marisol Rainey is about an eight-year-old girl named Marisol. And there is a tree in her backyard, which she has named Pepina, because Marisol believes that all important things should have their own names. So she has named the tree Pepina. And she's afraid to climb it. Her brother climbs the tree. Her brother's best friend climbs the tree. Her best friend climbs the tree. Um, but she's afraid of climbing it because she's afraid of heights and she's afraid of many other things as well. So um, the story is about Marisol and her overcoming um, her fears, basically. And Marisol is very much inspired by myself when I was eight years old. I was a very cautious, um, introverted um, worrywart. And that absolutely describes Marisol. And like Marisol, I believed that all things were sentient, all things were alive. So I would talk to the furniture. <laughs> I would talk to my stuffed animals, of course. Um, and that's pretty much how Marisol is, too. She also loves silent movies, which is something that I loved when I was a kid. Um, and the story is basically her journey and her uh, best friend, Jada, who's a very, very good best friend to her. And... There's a lot of Marisol's family life. Her mother's Filipino, and her father um, works on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. So he's only home one week out of the month. And she has an older brother named Oz and a cat named Jelly Beans because she names her stuffed animals and her real-life animal after her favorite foods. So she has four stuffed cats, stuffed animal cats, nacho, pot roast, banana split and lumpia and she has a a, a real life pet cat named jelly beans and she calls him beans for short i love that i was so enchanted by this idea of naming a cat pot roast that if we i uh, get another cat i think it's 50 50 i'm gonna try and pull i'll have to, I'll have to talk mrs cat into it but i think <laughs> pot roast is such a great name for a cat. yeah i agree so uh, who, who would be the ideal reader for the story that you're, you're hoping will pick this up? So the ideal reader would be um, someone who is just getting into reading books on their own. Um, it would be, you know, I like to think that it would speak to um, any young kid, of course, but specifically um, kids who know what it's like to be afraid of something, who... Um, we'll find a kindred spirit in Marisol, who is a worry wart. So if you're a little worry wart out there, if you your listeners know little worry warts in their lives, they would be an ideal audience for this book as well. Um, readers who, who want to read about an, a very endearing and special friendship. I think childhood best friendship is such a special relationship, but it's really celebrated in this book. Um, and there's also a lot of humor in it. You know, I, I, the illustrations gave me an opportunity to add um, little touches of humor and little peeks into Marisol's imagination. So even though Marisol is, is kind of a quiet kid, introspective kid, she has a very rich inner life and a very big imagination, which also comes through in the book. A uh, follow-up uh, from something you said before. Do you find yourself still talking to inanimate objects occasionally? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much the furniture, but I talk to my car a lot. Her name is Polly. Um, and, yeah, so I, I probably talk to Polly more than any other inanimate object. Um, like the other day, she my, my tire pressure light came on. You know, and, and whenever whenever that happens, I'll like tap Polly's dashboard and I'll say, it's OK, Polly, we're going to get your tires fixed. Don't worry. So, yes, I still do. <laughs> <laughs> so one day, many, many, many days from now, when Polly, you know, has, has run her last uh, mile and it's it's time to retire her someplace. Is that an extra hard day because you've developed sort of this uh, mostly one way? But who knows? Who knows what the Polly's thinking while you're driving around? 
Who knows? Well, you know, I like to think that Polly, wherever she goes, she's going to a better place, you know, like all my other past cars. I actually had a, um, before Polly, a couple cars before Polly, I had a car named Stella and I had to take Stella to the shop. And I was so used to calling her Stella that when I called the, um, the repair shop, I told them, I said, I'm calling to check on Stella. And there, and there's like a pause and they're like, who is Stella? And then I realized, oh, that's right. Other people don't know her name. Uh, I said, I'm sorry, Stella's my car. And then there's another pause, you know, um, and, and it occurs to me that some people think it's strange that, you you know, and some people don't think it's strange. A lot of people name their cars. Um, and in fact, whenever um, Dan, my partner, and I started dating, I asked him what his car's name was. And he just kind of looked at me and he's like, me my car doesn't have a name <laughs> like what all cars are supposed to have names um oh, anyway so i the deal breaker then <laughs> it, it was not a deal breaker but only because he then allowed me to name his car so his car's name is now jurgen <laughs> <laughs> that's a bold move for a first date <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I can't possibly, you know, and now Polly and Jurgen are in the garage and I have a whole backstory that Jurgen is trying to like pick up Polly because Polly's like this, you know, Jurgen's kind of, Jurgen has some miles on him. He's a little beat up Corolla, but my, but Dan loves the car. So, and he's going to drive it till it falls apart. And Polly's, you know, this little two door red, um, you know, zoom zoomy kind of car. So I like to say that, that Jurgen, you know tries to talk up Polly in the garage. So as you could see, I, I, I also have a, an active imagination. <laughs> that is a lot for him to overcome. So I hope he's, he's got a lot of, uh, a lot of personality to. <laughs> yes. you know, is very understated. He's a very nice car. He has nothing, you know, he's no, not pretentious in any way. He's just being himself. I'm sure it'll work out. <laughs> it's occurred to me. I named my very first car. I named her Carla. Uh, and then a couple of people made fun of me, and I haven't done it since. So that's kind oh, of oh, see, <laughs> well, now, now you have to go. You have to go do that now. I named my bike. I bought a bike, and the first thing I did was name her. And a lot of people ask me, "How do you come up with like how do you come up with the name Polly for your car and Gladys for your bike?" And I, my answer is always the same. I always say, "I always I just ask them what their name is, and they tell me." <laughs> People, of course, people give me like this look, and I'm like, eh, that's my answer. Yeah, but look what you do for a living. Why would you not be overflowing with imagination? Why, why would this be a surprise? Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Does, do you find that uh, same thing happening with your characters? Do they let you know what their name is? Yeah, oh, that's such a great question. They do, and a lot of times... Um, a lot of times I'll name my characters after young people that I've met on tour or at book signings because I'll meet someone who either has a, a, an intriguing name or they themselves are intriguing to me and I'll remember their names. And then when I'm drafting a character or when a character is kind of arriving in my imagination, um, I will ask them what their name is and they will tell me and sometimes it'll be a name. Um, you know, that I'm already familiar with or what have you. But that's that's actually a character exercise that I do for all my um, main characters is I do a writing prompt. Um, and it's also a writing prompt I give my students often is tell me how your character feels about their name. You know, pretend that the character has walked into a room and you've asked them, how do you feel about your name? And then write a first person monologue from your character's point of view. Um, and the reason I do that is because you find out a lot about a person based on the answer to that question, because the uh, there's nothing more personal than our names for whatever reason. Uh, you know, maybe we don't connect with our names. Maybe we don't identify with them. Maybe we want to change our names. Maybe we're indifferent. I mean, there's so many, you know, there's like studies that show that the human brain responds differently when we hear our name than any other sound in the world. And I find that so intriguing. So I do that exercise with all my characters. I ask them how they feel about their name. And when they tell me, their personality comes through, you know, because if they're kind of quiet and, and hesitant, that's how their monologue will come across. If they're very bold and outspoken, then 
that's how their monologue will come across. And I find it a very helpful exercise. Do you start with, well, uh, before I ask that question, I, I guess I should ask the obvious. Uh, with three names, Aaron and Trada Kelly, how do you feel about your name? Great question. So, you know, I'm at peace with it at this point. But when I was growing up, I did not connect with um, the name Aaron at all. And and for what reason? I have no idea. I think um, I think when I was a kid, being the little worry wart that I was, I didn't have a ton I mean, this, this sounds very sad and dramatic to say, but it's honest. I didn't have a ton that I liked about myself when I was a kid, and that included my name. Um, so my name could have been anything, and I probably would have thought it wasn't a good name. Um, I really wanted to have, like, a big fancy name like Stephanie. You know, this was the 80s, and there were a lot of Stephanies. Um so or a age of Stephanie. <laughs> yes, it was. It was a. It was a. It was a very popular time in the seventies and eighties for Stephanie's. Um. So, but now you know it's my name, and and I'm and I'm very cool with it. Yeah. So, uh, so many follow up questions, but uh, when when you're um, deciding on a character, do you sit down and do you write like a character sheet, all the information, and do you start with the character? Or is okay, I'm going to need this type of person in the story to serve this plot function. What type of person best serves that function? Um, no, I def uh, not the latter. I do the former. So all of my books start with a character. And all of my plotting happens through characters. So I never um, think, okay, this is my plot. Now what characters do I need to populate the plot? It's always, who are my characters? What does their world look like? What are they afraid of? What do they need to overcome? What do they want most out of life, internal and external? What's preventing them from getting those things? Um, what kind of person are they? What's it like to be them in the world? And that's how the plot comes to be. So it's it's never the other way around, if that makes sense. It's always character first. Uh, and then um, with Marisol, uh, you mentioned that you grew up in a small Louisiana town. Your mother was an immigrant from the, the, the Philippines. You're afraid of everything. And I saw, was this true? I saw on Twitter that you had just recently climbed your first ever tree. That can't, that can't be true. Is that true? That is true, yes. <laughs> About your whole true. life, not one tree? No, I was afraid. I was afraid I would fall. Um, and I was afraid of not being able to hoist myself up, you know, on that first branch and not being able to climb up and then falling. And yeah, no, I did not. So this weekend, actually, Sharon, the woman I mentioned, who's my writing partner, took me out to climb my first tree. So that's a, that's a you know. A check mark now. I can check check that off my bucket list. How did it feel? Felt pretty good. It was pretty cool to be up in that tree. There were ants in the tree, um, but they were not a stinging ants. So, so that made me feel a little bit better. I don't like bugs. I'm also afraid of bugs, of course, like anything that stings. Um, but I didn't get ants in my pants, uh, so it all worked out just fine, and I didn't fall. Wouldn't that be a great cosmic karmic moment to get up in the tree and you get bit by ants? Like, I was right. I never should have done it. <laughs> exactly, right? I get bit by ants and then I fall out because the ants are attacking me. And yeah. Uh, avoiding spoilers. Um, so that means fictional characters of yours have climbed trees and overcome tree climbing fears prior to you. Was it, um, I'm just curious, Was it, so you must not be the type of writer that, that feels like you have to go out and do the things your character does to be able to firsthand report that like a like a journalist. Like I've got a, a friend who went to the to an exact road and put water on the street to figure out which way it would run uh, to simulate blood for this, this action scene he was writing. Madness. Like, dude, just lie. Nobody's going to call you on it. <laughs> <laughs> um. So was it uh, was it the feeling that this is a celebration of the book and you didn't need to have that ahead of time with I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but I think yes, I, guess yes. <laughs> I think for me, it depends. Um, I will go out and do the thing, depending on what the thing is for this particular in this instance. Um, I, you know, I don't know that. 
it did occur to me to go out and climb a tree as I was writing this book, but I just never got around to it. Maybe I was just kind of like putting it off. But I think that that generally speaking in my books, the characters usually arrive at um, conclusions or or um, realizations before I do in a lot of different ways. You know, like a lot of my books are about self-acceptance, accepting yourself as you are, being kind, learning to be kind to yourself. And that's not something that I learned until adulthood. So even in, in internal life is um, my, my, my characters tend to arrive at um, some type of goal or, or understanding before I even do, if that makes sense. And so in this case, that is also true of Marisol without trying to give anything away. <laughs> um, fair enough. Uh, so with with Marisol, um, something I found uh, fascinating just about the characters, we start off with uh, everybody loves Pepina this tree, Marisol doesn't. Uh, so that's right away, that's, that's how we're presented uh, with her. Uh, and then the next uh, chapter is she's talking with uh, Jada about places that she might go and all the reasons she can't go there because it could immediately turn terrible. Uh, so we're, we're, we're introduced to this worry wart aspect. And yet I don't hate this character. I feel quite, <laughs> I like her. And as, as, as it goes, I'm, I'm rooting for her. How do you pull that trick off? This, this is, these are not likable things that Marisol is doing right off the bat. And yet she's yes. likable. That is such a great question because, it, and that's something that I kind of have struggled with in other books too, because I tend to write characters who can be a little defeatist and don't have a lot of faith in themselves. And that can get exhausting for readers, right? Because you're just kind of like, okay, um, I think um, the way I get around it or the way I hope that I get around it is it's written in third person and that create that does create a little more distance for the reader as they're experiencing Marisol. So if we were in first person, it would be very exhausting to spend a first person narrative with a character who's constantly talking about all the things they can't do and is constantly having these defeatist thoughts um, or is constantly feeling sorry for themselves. I mean, I, th I feel like that would be difficult in first person. So it's written in third person so that the reader has a little bit more perspective than Marisol does. Um, and knows that she's capable of more than than she understands herself to be. And that's kind of the joy of writing in, in third person, in my point of view. So was that a conscious decision going in that, hey, I'm writing this type of character, so I better make sure I don't do first person? Or did you figure that out as you were as you were working? No, I knew right off the bat that I was going to write it in third person. And I think that that's, you know, I don't know if it was as um, concrete as I just explained it, but that's definitely part of the thought process is sometimes I, I just know I'm not na naturally I, I go to third person usually as a, as a writer. Um, but I think that's why I think because a lot of my books and a lot of my characters, I, I want the reader to understand the character better than they know themselves. Um, and for me, it, that's easier to do in third person because you're able to give a little bit more perspective than first person allows. Uh, something I noticed um, is that, well, without spoiling, uh, Marisol maybe, maybe does not rescue a one-eyed cat. She literally saves a cat. I don't know if that was you kind of winking and nodding. It's like, hey, look at my character doing the, the heroic thing or that that just like that's a happy coincidence. It was um, it was kind of a happy coincidence, but it's also like because Marisol is a lot like me, I was channeling a lot of I, I was channeling a lot of myself because that's the kind of kid I was. You know, I was always like, oh, I have to no one's going to want this one. So that's the one that I have to get, you know, um, because otherwise it'll just be alone the whole time. Um, and that's another thing that that I felt like was important. You know, when I was a kid. I was very, very sensitive and a lot of things made me sad and a lot of things hurt my feelings. And when I was growing up, that really felt like a liability. It didn't feel like a good thing to be. Um, and I want young people to know that that it's not a liability. It's actually a good thing. It's a good thing if you if you have empathy and compassion 
Um, so I wanted to show that in Marisol as well and show it as, as something to be celebrated and not something to feel bad about, if that makes sense. Ah, and then uh, this is this is the first book you've illustrated, right? Yes. So if somebody buys the audio book, does that just drive you a little bit nuts? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm glad you bought the book, but you're missing it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it, however people want to consume the book, I'm totally happy with. Did you know going in that you were going to be uh, illustrating? Would you figure that out after the fact? I did. I, I did know going in. And... Um, I tried not to think about it too much because I was afraid because I, you know, didn't consider myself an illustrator. Um, so I tried not to let it distract me, but it definitely did mess with my head a little bit, just knowing that I was going to have to draw things. And one thing that I tried not to do at first, I, I found myself writing the book in such a way where, you know, there were times when I was like, oh, I, I can't write that because I can't draw that, you know, <laughs> Um, because my, my, I'm not, you know, my, my abilities as an illustrator are, are ever evolving. We'll just say that. Um, but then, you know, I realized, okay, the story is the most important thing and I have to write the story as it's asked to be written. And I can't like change things just to fit my skill or lack thereof as an illustrator. I'll just have to figure out how to illustrate the thing that I think I can't illustrate. And that's what I wound up doing. So was this like a third down the gauntlet for yourself? I've talked about doing this and I want to do it or somebody knew that you could illustrate and said, when are you going to do this? How did it come to be that you were going to be the illustrator? It was uh, my editor. She she saw because I'd post on Instagram now and then and, and on Twitter different illustrations. And she didn't realize that I could draw because I didn't think to mention it because I didn't consider myself an illustrator. I just considered myself someone who liked to draw doodles and for fun. And when she saw that, she said, oh, you, you can draw. And I could see the question marks, you know, floating over her head. And that's how it came to be. And she really believed that I could illustrate this book. And I believe her now, now that the book is done and out and has illustrations. <laughs> but at the time, I thought she doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, but she cheerleaded me the whole, cheerleaded, cheerled me the whole way. Um, and you know, and thanks to her, you know, it got done. But it was definitely not my original idea. And if you're comfortable sharing, what is your editor's name? Virginia. And Virginia, if you're listening, you are welcome to come on the show anytime. Oh my gosh, we'd love to have you. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you're, you're going to illustrate the book. Do you keep it completely separate where you sit down and you write the full book and then start figuring out what everything is going to look like? Or are you illustrating part, part of the way to keep the story building in your mind? I actually wasn't sure what, what I was supposed to do since I'd never done it before. Um, but then I, I learned that you write the whole, I wrote the whole manuscript first and then, um, and then went through with Virginia, uh, my editor to figure out, okay, what, what would be good as illustrations? Now that the first book is done, I have a much better grasp on the process. So, you know, the next book will be hopefully easier. Um, but with this book, yeah, we wrote the manuscript first and then went through and figured out what to illustrate. Gotcha. So it's completed. And then when, how do you figure out uh, how many illustrations per chapter and what needs to, I mean, you can literally draw everything that ever happens in the story yeah. how do you, and select what, what you want uh, specifically to, to, to represent? Good question. A lot of it was talking with my editor and the art director, Sylvie, and looking at it um on the page like actually laid out on the page and and trying to figure out okay how many illustrations do we want um and they gave me a lot of leeway in other words they were like okay well you could have each chapter begin with a full page illustration you could do spot illustrations throughout you could do occasional full page illustrations and um eventually we landed on there's illustrations on almost every page and it's a mix of spot illustrations full page, uh, two page, double spreads. So um, the main thing was consistency. 
you know, if, if you're going to have a, an illustration on every page for the first 15 pages, you don't want to then go 15 pages with no illustrations. So we just made sure it was consistent, you know. Gotcha. Uh, do you go back and read your own books? I don't. No, I don't. Okay, I was curious if if, if, you, if you didn't have a if you have a problem or didn't have a problem, would it be made more intense by the fact that there are also illustrations uh, staring back? At That's you? true. Yes, I have. I have with Marisol. I have definitely gone through and looked. I've flipped through the book many, many times just because I I'm, I can't. You know, I have to say I'm proud of myself that I. Um, illustrated them so it's kind of like blows my mind that i you know it's like how did i do this you know um but no i don't i typically don't go back unless it's like you know i'm reading an arc an advanced copy and i need to like do some kind of proofing or something but when the book is finished and, it, and it's out in hardcover i don't i don't go back and read them typically so we're not going to find you with a copy of we dream of space going yes i did it <laughs> 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 no, <laughs> no, no, you won't see that. <laughs> uh, you've talked pretty publicly uh, about negative thoughts and, and, and mentioned it, I alluded to it a couple of times as we've been talking. So I think it's fair to ask and, and, and just tell me it's not and I'll cut this out like it never happened uh, if, if it's not. Um, but I'm, I'm with you as, a, as a, a child and as a teenager. As a child, I had an overinflated uh, opinion of my own worth, but certainly into, uh, into adolescence. A big part of that was discovering, oh, I must be the worst human that ever lived, and then trying to figure out somewhere in between those those two extremes. Um, and your characters, um, certainly uh, Marisol, and I know some of your other characters have to deal with their negative thoughts. And then you are in, engaging in creative endeavors every day. You've got to have negative thoughts still uh, haunting around, saying it's 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 never going to be as good as it was before, or or maybe they're saying something completely opposite. I won't give those voices bad ideas. Whatever they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> how do you overcome those um, and, and get them out of your way? And how did you do that when you were younger as well? That's a that's a really great question. So um, when I was younger, I don't, to be honest, when I was younger, books, you know, people say this a lot, but it really is true for me. Books really saved my life and writing saved my life. Um and I had this big dream that I was going to be a writer one day and I was going to be published. And and I kind of wore that dream as a blanket, you know, whenever I would get depressed. I suffered from uh, depression almost my whole life. Um, I would think, you know, one day none of this will matter because I'm going to be a writer and my dreams are going to come true. And I kind of hung my my hat on that dream. And as I got older and you know, and the dream actually came true. Then there's a whole new slew of, of, of problems in that, oh, my dream came true. And then you have the negative thoughts of, oh, um, am I going to live up to people's expectations? Um, do I deserve all these wonderful things that are happening? Um, you know, so on and so forth, endless, endlessly. And I you know, for me, you know, and I've, I, I try to talk a lot about imposter syndrome because I don't think it's something that writers talk enough about. And one thing that I've learned, you know, of course, I won the Newbery Medal in 2018, and a lot of people would consider that an, an apex, right? Like, like at the summit of of accomplishment in the world of children's oh, literature. It was immediately followed by a Newbery honor. <laughs> 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 yeah, so now I'm good. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, you know, obviously, um, it's a great, a tremendous honor and it's life changing. But um, there's there's always going to be, I, I say all this to say that no matter how successful you are, um, there's always another mountain that's a little bit higher that you can climb. And I think that the key is to use that to motivate you to do better to try to keep things in perspective instead of always instead of allowing it to drag you down for example okay um if you know you win the newberry medal okay well uh katie camillo's won two newberry medals and a newberry honor and this author has won four has been recognized four times and this author is on the new york times bestseller list for four years running and this author has had three 
books made into movies. I mean, there's always someone out there who is accomplishing more and seems to be doing it better. So I, I say all that to say that if you fall into the comparison game, it's a game you'll never win. You cannot win the game. So what I try to do is, is keep it in perspective and think about what I said earlier in the hour, which was my dream was to write books that people connected with for different reasons and that spoke to people. And that may be five people. It could be 500 people. It could be 500,000 people, no matter what the number is. The important thing is that's the important thing at the core. So I try to keep things in perspective and I try to use all the self doubt to just propel me, you know, to motivate me to do better. Okay. Well, if I don't like what I did in this book, Maybe I'll try something new in this book. Maybe I'll try writing, um, like I said, a science fiction or something, you know, like always trying to do better and evolve. And I think that helps quell some of those, those whispers of self-doubt, you know, because you're always striving to do better while also recognizing that you'll probably never be the best because it's an arbitrary title anyway. Well, for all those writers listening, just know uh, that even if you manage to bury all of your contemporaries in, in the dirt, uh, you will not top William Shakespeare. They <laughs> he's got the trophy. There's always someone doing better. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's entirely possible he has no idea. <laughs> that is absolutely entirely possible, yes. So, Okay. Um, I, I asked you about negative thoughts. Now let's talk about something overwhelmingly positive. I love this story and I want to live vicariously through you for just a moment because you get you get the, the, the how's this go? You get a call for the Newberry Medal. How does that lead to you quitting a job that you're working? Tell us that story so we can all we can all experience it vicariously through you. Yes. So my third book, Hello Universe, came out and I was working as a, a copy editor um, for a, a corporate uh, healthcare company. And I get the phone call while, whilst I'm on my way to work. I'm on 95 driving into Philly and I get the call that I won the medal. And what the, the medal does is, you know, your life pretty much changes overnight because your book um, s almost immediately goes on the New York Times list. I think it went on the list the, the following week. And then you get all these um, foreign rights uh, people interested in, in publishing your book uh, in other languages. So you get a lot of foreign rights deals. And then my first two books then earned out, which they had not earned out yet, but when Hell Universe came out. So all this amazing stuff happened fairly quickly. And it was in... Uh, I can't remember when I got the phone call. It must have been in January. But by March, I was able to quit my job and, um, you know, write full time and then eventually teach part time. Um, so that's how it happened. It, it, it was it was pretty quick, I have to say. And I also had um, I, I was very fortuitous in that when they announced the the Newberry um metal i had a book release the like i think it was the following week which was very good timing for me because then that book hit the new york times list because it just so happened to come out at the exact same time so then people bought both of the books um so it was in it was within a few months i was able to i bought everyone at, at on my floor at work pizza to celebrate the New York Times being a New York Times bestseller, which is, a, you know, the dream of, of, of many an author, including me. Um, so I was very, very excited about it. I bought everyone pizza and then I quit the next day. <laughs> <laughs> now, knowing that uh, although the books are selling like crazy, you're going to be waiting for what, like maybe a six month lag before the, some of that money starts to hit your account? Yes, oh. because, yeah, because there's... Well, after some of it was, um, I signed a, the next book deal, you know, the book, the contract for the next books. Um, 
So that happens soon after the Newberry announcements. And then you get the royalties twice a year. So then there was a, definitely a lag time before the next royalties come in. But in between that, there's a lot of foreign um, rights deals and all this other stuff happening as well. Uh, and then um, uh, Hello Universe is being adapted by Netflix. Where are we at with the adaptation? And then You Go First is uh, going to be a stage production. Is that right? It is. So You Go First, I'm not sure where we are in that, in that process, actually. It was a company out of Arizona that was going to produce it. Um, but for Netflix, right now they're in the process of interviewing or finding directors. The, produ the, the producers are looking for directors. So there's a script. Now we're looking for directors. And once a director is in place, then all the other things can start happening. Things like casting and all that good stuff. Are you involved with any of that? Or are you just kind of reading the updates as they come and say, oh, yay? Yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm reading the updates and saying, oh, yay. I'm I'm definitely not um, an author who wants to be closely involved. You know, I mean, I want to be involved in that. I want to go visit the set and, and you know, feel cool on the set <laughs> and see a movie being made. But I don't need to be, I don't need to be, nor do I want to be actively involved in the production. Uh, and then you've got a pen tweet. Uh, that uh, says it's a, a note that somebody passed you at a signing that says thank you for writing about Filipino American girls like me. What does that note mean to you for your writing, and is that the best reader reaction you have? I would say it's definitely one of the best, and um, if not the best, and for a few reasons. One of them being that um, that note was passed to me in. LA at the Los Angeles Library during a book signing and the mother uh, had her daughter with her and the mother said my daughter is very shy but she wants to tell you something but she's too shy to, to say it so she wrote it on this postcard and then the girl slipped it to me um, so it wasn't even what was written on the note which was obviously very moving but also the fact that it was a a, a girl who wanted to tell me something but was shy and I kind of have a soft spot for um, the quiet, shy kids. Um, so that was very meaningful to me. Um, and it's hard to put into words what it actually means for me because, you know, when I was a kid, if I had been able to read books that had all different kinds of characters, including Filipino American characters, especially, but even just um, immigrant families or families who struggled with, with money or, you know, something that reflected my life it would have been incredibly meaningful and would have helped me navigate life a little bit better and so that's what i hope that my books do and and luckily there's so many books out there um besides my books that that do that that depict all walks of life and i think it's incredibly important that we have that for them I agree. After everyone's read your books, by God, uh, explore elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. What the heck with that? Read my books, then read. Yes, their, then. Read, read both of our books, all of our books, and then read the other people's books. <laughs> uh, Aaron and Jonathan Kelly, have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? I have not. I do have. I do have a, a kind of a ghost story though. Are you ready? Okay. All right. So years ago. I'll try to be brief with my story, but years ago, I was staying at the Monteleone Hotel in New Orleans, which is in the French Quarter, and it is known to be haunted because it's in New Orleans in the French Quarter, and I was alone, and all of a sudden, it was about 3 a.m. in the morning, so it was about the witching hour, the fire alarm goes off, and it wakes me up, obviously, I'm in my pajamas, the alarm is blaring. I have to cover my ears. I peek my head out of the door into the hall, and there's no one there. And I think, that's strange. But the, the, the alarm is blaring, and then all of a sudden, there's a recorded voice that comes on, and it says, evacuate, use the stairs, do not use the elevators, and it replayed over and over and over. So I thought, I got to get out of here, right? So I put my shoes on, I'm still wearing my pajamas. I don't brush my teeth, I don't do anything. I grab like my purse. I go out in the hall, I'm the only one in the hall. 
And my ears are ringing from this alarm that's so loud. And I'm covering my ears like this. And I'm on the 14th floor. So I go down the stairs. And I'm the only one in this, on the stairs. And I think, what is going on? Am I, should I have taken the elevator? Did everyone else take the elevator? But I'm just following the orders of the recorded voice over the thing. And the whole way down, I'm still covering my ears because the alarm is so loud. I get down to the lobby door. I push open the door. I step out into the lobby. And all of a sudden, the alarm goes off. And all these people turn and look at me because I have just like bounded into the lobby somewhat frantically in my pajamas with my hair tangled from sleep with both my hands over my ears. And I'm looking at them and they're looking at me and there's no alarm. So I go to the, de the front desk and my, ear my ears are still ringing from this alarm. That's how loud it was. I cannot stress to you how loud it was. I go to the front desk and I say, are we supposed to be evacuating? And the guy at the front desk says, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, the fire alarm. And he said, what alarm? And then he called the manager and the manager came and the manager says there was no alarm. And lo and behold, I was the only person apparently in the entire Hotel Monteleon that heard this alarm. And it went off as soon as I stepped into the lobby and no one knew what I was talking about. That is the start of a really fantastic novel. So you should say that story. And I'm looking forward to reading the expansion. What, what else do you hear that no one else can hear from that moment forward? And I want to hear from people. If anyone's ever experienced anything like that before, please tell me. Because I'm telling you, that alarm was so loud, my ears were ringing. And I was the only one who heard it. That is a fantastic story. You built in the suspense. I was on the edge of my seat. If that didn't sell some books, by golly, nothing we're going to talk about this. <laughs> That's right. This has been wonderful. I'm watching our, our time, and I know we've come right to the end of it. Thank you uh, so much for making time for me, for esteemed audience. Uh, my last question, there's always some variation. Uh, if there was something you could go back and, and say to yourself uh, at the start of your career, wherever in your career would have been most useful, some advice you would have given yourself that would have made a huge amount of difference and might make a huge amount of difference for everyone listening, what would you go back and tell yourself? You know what? I think I'd keep it simple and just say, don't worry, everything will be okay. Would you have believed you? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm sure people did tell me that, and I probably didn't believe them. But but I would keep it simple. <laughs> but maybe if it was actually you, it would have it would have done the trick. <laughs> yes. Although if it were me, I would be skeptical. Like, where did you come from? Are you from the future? How did this happen? But, um, you know, we're now we're getting too complex about it. But yes, if it were me from the future telling me of the past, don't worry. I'd I'd believe myself. I'd believe my future self. With lots of follow-up questions. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, of course. Who wouldn't, right? Where uh, can esteemed audience find you online, follow you on social media, all that good stuff? On social media, I am Erin Entrada. And online, I'm erinentradakelly.com. And I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, an esteemed audience, as always, for interviews with all the most wonderful people, uh, head to middlegradeninja.com. Download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. It will change your life. And God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.